Good morning, everyone. And we are sauntering. Woohoo! Today, it is Psalm 112. We've reached this, these dizzy heights of achievement. Um, <clears throat> let's pray and ask the Lord to be with us. So, Lord Jesus, we welcome you again this morning as we open your word. We pray as we do that you would speak to us. You will come, make your presence known in our home, in our lives today, Lord Jesus. We love you. Amen. Good morning, Kathy and Fran and Colin and Kev and Tracy Ann and Wendy. Great to have you guys on board. <clears throat> uh, this is a lovely psalm. It's full of ammunition for your prayer life. And uh, it's also a interesting mirror image, if you like, of the psalm we did yesterday. Good morning, Chris and Sandy. It is and Kev. It is also a again another acrostic psalm where the where it's very tightly structured according to a Hebrew in central Hebrew um, poetry type of thing. Good morning, Amy, Deepak, and Pat and Mike. Where each stanza starts with a different letter or successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. For me, that doesn't mean anything at all, except it's interesting because I don't speak Hebrew. Um, but um, fascinating. And actually, if you look at it, good morning, Esther. Good morning, John. It actually, the psalm we did yesterday, it's almost like a kind of, even the verses seem to line up in a kind of mirror image. And the one yesterday is is about God and his nature and so on. And this one today is about the person who is walking with God and his or her nature as a result of that and the kind of life and things they can expect. So let's crack on. He says, praise the Lord. Always a good thing to do any time of day or night. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his command, in his commandments. And if you remember, I don't know if anyone was with me on Psalm 1 when we did Psalm 1. It's lost in the kind of depths of Facebook somewhere. Um, it says, blessed is the man. And it's very much along this lines of who, who doesn't walk in the way of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or, or sit in the seat of scornful. But his delight, or if it's a woman, her delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. And he's saying... This is a really, really happy, blessed person who knows how to, who delights in, who fears the Lord to start with and who delights in his commandments. Good morning, Chris and Ruth. So it's, good morning, Sarah. It's like we, we're not just living in a kind of godly, ooh, kind of respect and awe of God, but there he is out there and, you know, we're here and he's just kind of someone we're very conscious of and try not to mess with. It's not that alone, that it, that could be described as the fear of the Lord, but he's saying who greatly delights in his commandments. Good morning, um, Lali, La, Latika, and uh, uh, welcome. And so he's saying we're not just like kind of fearing God in an abstract kind of way but actually God's words are a delight to me and I would imagine the very fact that you're doing the saunters with me um, and many of you have faithfully stuck with me day in and day out which has been absolutely brilliant and lovely for me um, and a huge privilege it's you you obviously have got some regard for God's word and you care about what God says and you want to understand it and you want to kind of dwell in it and think about it and get it into you in the mornings. Good morning, Julie and Hayes. And so this is what we're talking about, who greatly delights in his commandments. And I think it's true to say that as we've gone through the saunters, we've fallen in love again and again with God and with his word. And we've we've found ourselves kind of drinking and being refreshed and, and someone said to me the other day sometimes you've you've good morning Esther and John and Joan and Joyce you've come on sometimes looking really tired and and I've watched you as you've come alive and and I think God has been kind to me through doing these things as we've looked at his word he's refreshed me as well and and it, I think that's the way it works his 
word is something we can feed on and it actually does us good and makes us feel stronger. Good morning, Michael. And I don't think understanding it necessarily fully in all the intricate detail is the key. I think it's just that we delight in it and we allow it to wash over us and kind of saturate our thoughts in our being and it pops up later in the day and we meditate on it again and we talked right back in Psalm 1 about the person who meditates on the word of God being like a cow chewing the cud. They've eaten the grass already but then it's later in the day they're chewing it over and it's still doing them good and still nutritious and they're getting more nutrition from it. Um, so then it goes on to describe this person who is blessed and who delights in the Lord, fears the Lord and delights in his commandments. It says, verse two, his offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Let's just pause there for one second. So let's just, good morning, Sally. Great to have you. Let's just say um, that the, thank you, Joyce. That's really lovely. Um, Let's just say that this applies to a man or a woman um, regardless. So his or her offspring will be mighty in the land. Now, this is a promise for our children. I've, when I started reading this, I'm, I'm saying, God, I want to claim that now. I claim this word over my children. So I named my children. Then my daughter's expecting a baby. So over my grandchildren as well. And I thought, why stop there? Let me name it over my great grandchildren as well. Good morning, Ruth. And... Yeah, lots of love to you, Sally. Um, so we can claim these promises as somebody who loves God and loves his word. We can take hold of these promises and say, yes, God, I claim that for mine. And I don't know if you're in the habit of doing that, but speak it out loud in your house and just say, God, I declare this promise over my children that they will be mighty in the land. That means they'll be strong and vigorous and doing well. And with, excuse me, with God's favor on them. And the generation, it's not just like one generation, but the generation that comes out of us, of, of upright people, will be blessed. And we really do need to go to the bank with this stuff. Go to the bank of heaven and say, come on, God, I'm claiming this over my family. Now, I don't know many people who could say, do you know what, at, at my family, my kids, my grandchildren, everything is perfect. We've we've 100 percent arrived. This is exactly what we're experiencing now. We don't have a cloud in the sky. Their houses are all paid off. They've all got jobs. They're all doing well. They're all loving God and worshiping him and so on. For most of us, it's a work in progress. But this is something that we can go. This is a check that God has written. We can go to the bank of heaven with and say, come on, God. You have said that my offspring, make it personal, you've said my offspring will be mighty in the land and that my generation, the children coming after me, will be blessed. Verse 3, wealth and riches are in his house and righteousness endures forever. Now, I have some issues because people like to pick a fight over stuff that they don't agree with. So there are many people who have a problem, particularly in England, with the prosperity gospel. Now, I don't particularly believe the gospel is the gospel of prosperity. However, it is good news to the poor. So let me just say that. The gospel, good news, is good news to the poor, according to Isaiah and according to Jesus. And so we have to get this into our heads that actually the gospel means that things are gonna change. When we receive Jesus, it means that things are going to change. And if we're poor, it means that God is now on in our corner acting for us. It doesn't mean that we're all going to own a private jet. I do not believe in that kind of gospel. That is a fiction. It's <laughs> certainly not in the Bible. But it does mean that things are going to change because Jesus is involved now. <clears throat> and so when it talks about wealth and riches are in his house, I think about God's house. That's my father's house. Where does my daddy live, right? My daddy's rich. My mama's good looking. This is a good message. This is a good word. And wealth and riches are in his house. 
I'm his child, so is it not possible that some of that wealth and riches could be in my house? I don't believe that God wants to keep us living like um, scratching around like beggars because then all our preoccupation is in where's my next meal going to come from? And there is, you know, we, we, we deal with poor people. Poverty is a horrid, horrid thing. There is no nobleness, if you like, nobility in being poor and penniless and scratching around for a living. And so what, the, but what, God, what this promise is that God has resources that are available to us and he wants to bring them into our house as well. Now, I'm just thinking for a little moment in my father's house, my actual dad, who now lives with my heavenly dad in heaven. So he's not on the earth anymore. He had a big workshop because he was a blacksmith and he had lots of tools and equipment and stuff. And it was fantastic. If I needed to make anything out of steel or make a little thing for the house or I wanted to make some brackets or something, all I had to do was drive up to his house and it was all there. And he wouldn't charge me for the steel. He would let me use it. And it was fantastic. And uh, so in my dad's house were resources. One day my car broke down and my dad had a Land Rover, so I got Anna to sit in the, uh, to drive the Land Rover and me sit in the car and we towed the car home. And I was able to use my dad's resources. Right. Now, this is what we're talking about. This is about being a source and a resource to other people and to poor people. So the person who loves God, who walks with God and is a person of faith and is engaging with the economy of heaven has resources that the person who doesn't know God does not have access to. So that makes us very rich, very wealthy. And let's let's just get our head away from just seeing wealth and riches purely in economic terms, but see it in terms of resources and access to resources when we need it. So God is a very present help in a time of need. That is a resource. Paul White is a resource to his children. My children come to my house if they want to borrow a drill or a, some tools out of my shed. They are welcome. They come and they say, oh, dad, can I borrow blah or Paul can, you know, whatever. And so it's a pleasure for me to have a few things around that are not just doing the stuff for me but are a resource if you have a car you are rich and it means that you have a resource that you can share with other people and maybe you can give a lift to somebody who doesn't have a car or maybe you can go pick up someone shopping who can't get there because they're they're uh shielding or whatever and they're shut down in their home if if you live in this country and you have a roof over your head, you are pretty rich compared to lots of people in the world. And so I believe that the Western Christians who are doing well are a resource to the rest of the world. Now, when it's working well, that is actually happening. And we have to be careful that we don't get so caught up with our own needs and our own wishes and desires that we forget to be a resource to other people. Cool. Oh, that's nice, John. My dad rescued John once when his, when his Land Rover broke down. Yeah, Land Rovers, they call off-road vehicles because they're off the road as much as they're on it. But that's, sorry, that's a Land Rover joke. Um, but wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Who does that sound like? It sounds like God, doesn't it? Well, that's the point. So the person who is blessed by God and who fears the Lord and loves his word and all the rest of it is actually starting to resemble his dad. So the things that are in my father's house are now present in my house because he has bestowed and lavished his riches on me and now I have those things in my house too. So when it says wealth and riches are in his house, they're in my house and his righteousness, my righteousness, his righteousness, my heavenly father's righteousness, but my righteousness, the righteous person who is walking with God, his or her righteousness endures forever as well. 
come on. Now, what we're saying is that the acts that we do that are kind of come from the heart of God, if you like, the motivation in our hearts is to love and serve people. Those righteous acts last forever. They don't fade away. They're eternal. This is really, really good. Verse five. Oh, sorry, verse four, light dawns in darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful and righteous. Now, I believe that is to do with revelation. When it's dark, <clears throat> the person who has a torch is a lucky person <laughs> or fortunate or happy. Though the person who has a candle has got an advantage over the person who doesn't. So when it's dark, when times are dark, we need a light source. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He then said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. And so he also went on to say that a city on a hill, no one lights a light and hides it under a basket, but they, and so on and so on. We know this stuff. We're here to bring light into a dark place. And the person, what I believe what this is a picture of revelation and insight. When we know God and we listen to his voice, again, we have a resource that the person who doesn't know God does not have. We have an ability to navigate. It's like we have a searchlight, we have a torch. Um, the One of the Psalm 119, which we're coming to says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You show me the way. You make a way where there seems to be no way. And so light dawns in the darkness for the upright. That is one of the characteristics of somebody who's walking with God is that he or she has light in their lives. They can see where they're going, but also they have light to share with other people. And so the person who's listening to God will be full of revelation. They won't always be telling you stories about what happened 40 years ago, the one time God they saw God move. They'll be telling you stuff about now and what God is doing in their lives now and what God is saying to them now. And they'll shine light on the scripture and make it come alive to you. This is what we're talking about. But this person is gracious, merciful and righteous. Again, these are qualities of God himself. So the, what, this is really explicit. The person who is walking with God will begin to demonstrate the qualities of God himself. Verse five, it is well with the man who deals generously and lends. Yeah, everybody likes someone who's generous, don't they? Of course we do. Do we want to go out for the evening with someone who's mean? Probably not. If we go out for the evening with someone who's generous, it'll be fun because they'll be joining in and they'll be sharing, a, you know, and buying you some drinks and all this kind of thing. And it'll be a happy <coughs> occasion. And you don't have to be rich rich with lots and lots of money to be generous you can be generous with your time you can be generous with your praise you can be generous with your smile you can walk around smiling and giving your smiles away to people and not have any money in the bank whatsoever but so it is well with the man or woman who deals generously and lends who conducts his or her affairs with justice and again, it's how we do business, how we conduct ourselves through the day. How are you when you're interacting with the cashier at the supermarket or the post office or the person on the end of the phone when your delivery hasn't come and so on and so on and so on. Are you a generous spirited person? Are you kind when someone does something for you? Do you acknowledge it and say thank you so much? Do you Give generously, just out of your heart, just of your time, of your smile, of your money, whatever resources you have at the time. Because that person, verse 5 says, it is well with that person. Now we hear a lot in our day and age about well-being. It's become a buzzword. It's a really good thing to have, sense of well-being. But wellness and well-being is not just about making sure everything's okay with me. According to this psalm, it is well with the person who is generous. So if you want to have a sense of well-being, be generous. Um, and conduct your affairs with justice. Um, sometimes if you lend stuff, it doesn't come back or it does come back broken. 
and you have to there again there's another opportunity for us to be generous isn't there and sometimes you know generosity isn't cheap always <laughs> anywho verse 6 for the righteous will never be moved he will be remembered forever isn't that glorious um the righteous will never be moved he will be remembered forever and there is that sense of someone who leaves behind a legacy and it's not just that we want to get mem remembered and everything but there is something good to know that the righteous acts we do are for eternity they they just they just stand for all time um verse 7 is a really important one verse he is not afraid of bad news <clears throat> his heart is firm trusting in the lord his heart is steady he will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries or adversaries um so there are some people aren't there who we know who are always anticipating bad news and if they can't find any they kind of create it and there's always some crisis some drama unfolding and <clears throat> their stuff is always 10 times worse than anybody else's and you're kind of like really um <laughs> but this person who is walking with god is not afraid of bad news they're not going around expecting something to go wrong or expecting something to break they're expecting things to go well actually but when bad news does come <clears throat> We take it on the chin. We say, yeah, OK, so this isn't what I was expecting. I wasn't hoping for this. But now this is the situation we're in. And here we go. Let's see how God helps us now then. So the car breaks down. You're going to be late for work and so on and so on. You look at your phone. There's no battery. It's like, ah, and you're in a predicament. OK, God, how can you help me in this situation? And when the prayer house fire, um, building burnt down uh, a little bit over a year ago now, it wasn't something we were expecting. <laughs> it wasn't something we wanted. It wasn't good news. It was bad news. And, and it hasn't been easy since. But God has been with us and God is still with us. When COVID came along, that wasn't good news. It hasn't been good news for a lot of people. But now we're in this situation, God, where are you and how are you going to help me? So we're not like we're f not fearing bad news coming. We're not kind of living in fear and negativity all the time. Um, verse eight is a beauty. It says his heart is steady or her heart is steady. So it's like these things happen, but they don't wobble my equilibrium. And I was saying to someone yesterday, one of the challenges and, and needs in a leader is the ability to maintain an equilibrium inside, even in the middle of all kinds of changing circumstances. And that might seem a long way off for you, but God can give that to you, that grace to you, because it's in here. And you can go back to God and say, God, let me be that one whose heart is steady. Come on, it's in your word. It's a thing. And and I look at the context of it. He says he will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversary. So he's saying, like, in the middle of conflict and difficulty, this person who loves God and fears God and loves his word, delights in his word, and who is blessed by God, even in the middle of conflict, their heart is steady. They've not gone into a tailspin and gone completely down the plug hole, but they're holding in there and able to hold a steady course until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. And that's saying until the victory's won. Now, I love it when God speaks to us and says, I've already won this one. The battle's won. The battle's mine. And we're just, someone's calling me. We have to go through the battle to get to the other side. But we can look, but... Uh, if our heart is fixed on him, he gives us perfect peace. He keeps us in perfect peace. And we can um, look in triumph on our, on our, on our adversaries. And, and sometimes it's really fun, isn't it, to look back and think about those challenges and adversaries that came against us and just say, wow, God, you brought me through that one. That is amazing. Thank you, God. You are so good. Um, verse 9 
It says he is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honour. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Now that's a, um, a verse that's quoted by the Apostle Paul in uh, 2 Corinthians to inspire God's people to be generous. And actually, if we want to be like God, we will be generous. And so this is God. He's distributed freely. But this is also the righteous person who's walking with God, who loves God, distributing freely, given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. <clears throat> His horn is exalted in honour. And so really what we're doing when we're giving to the poor and we're distributing and sharing what we've got, we are um, just being a uh, kind of illustration of what God the Father is actually like. God is generous. And he loves to lavish his gifts on the poor. Um, his righteousness endures forever. Again, this is, a, this is true of God, but it's true of his people. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honour. Now we talked about the horn in the Old Testament being a symbol of strength and victory and all of that. And this is also true of the person who loves God and walks with God and fears the Lord and delights in his commands is that his horn is exalted in honour. It means just that God lifts them up, gives them victory and success and to do them well, basically. And verse 10 is like the end of Psalm 1, where it talks about the wicked are not so, they're like the wind, the chaff that the wind drives away and so on. And the wicked man sees it and is angry. So there is resentment sometimes coming from those who are pursuing evil objectives when they see God prospering and blessing one of his children. There's, a, there's more than a little bit of hostility sometimes. But whatever, that's what I think. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. So it's like, yeah, gnash your teeth, mate. Go on, go on, go and ganache over there somewhere. And <laughs> I'm gonna just enjoy being blessed. And let's not listen to the gnashings of the wicked. And the desire of the wicked will perish. There you go. What a great psalm. Read it through in um, the Passion Translation. It's really, really good. I'm going to pray and then I have to crack on. I've got some appointments lining up. So, Lord Jesus, bless us today. Let today be a day where this psalm unfolds for us and becomes real to us. And Lord, let us see, <clears throat> excuse me, these promises coming true in our lives. And Lord, we particularly want to lay hold of that promise to our children. We just want to lay hold of that promise that our children are going to be mighty in the land. Come on, Lord. Effective, influential, significant young people growing up in our homes to change the world and make a difference in jesus name we love you lord amen have a great day everyone lots of love